In the first months after war began, both North and South mobilized. Men were needed to fill the ranks. In the North, the 16th President Abraham Lincoln called for 75,000 three-month volunteers. Seeking excitement, adventure, and certain this would be a short war, they came in mass. To them, politicians and the press, the war's strategy was simple. On to Richmond. This is the story of how wrong they were. July 21st, 1861. A day when expected battlefield glory morphed into the grim reality of what war truly is. Hard lessons learned some 25 miles to the southwest of Washington City on the plains of Manassas. The last five letters of history spell story, and that's exactly how history should be taught. Numbers and dates have no soul. Such presentations fall flat, for history is alive and relevant. Welcome to Threads from the National Tapestry, stories from the American Civil War. This series will feature events and people from that period and will strive to make you feel as if you were there, to show that history is indeed a story. It was around noon, and at headquarters of the 1st Brigade of the newly designated Confederate Army of the Potomac, Brigadier General Millage L. Bonham was informed that a young lady wanted to see him. At first, he refused to see her. Only 20 miles from Washington City and 10 miles from the main Confederate Army at Manassas Junction, Virginia, a sensitive Southern High Command gave orders not to allow any women to pass through the lines, but this lady insisted. Something about important information. Gaining an audience, Betty Duvall walked in, an attractive brunette with eyes that sparkled. She was dressed in clothing a farm woman might wear. The day before, she had driven out of Washington City and traveled some 14 miles with news that had to be delivered. If deemed important enough, she was told it would be forwarded to the Southern Army's commanding officer, Brigadier General P.G.T. Beauregard. Assured, Bonham then reported, she took out her tucking comb and let fall the longest and most beautiful roll of hair that he had ever seen on a human head. She took from the back of her head, where it was safely tied, a small package, not larger than a silver half dollar, carefully sewed up in black silk. Once unfolded, Bonham immediately recognized its source. She was reliable. Washington socialite Rose O'Neill Greenhow, who had access to the innermost federal political and military circles. The message? The Union Army of Northeastern Virginia has been ordered to advance on the 16th of July. Three months and four days after the firing on Fort Sumter, events were now in motion for the first great land battle of the American Civil War. First, the principles. The Federal Army of Northeastern Virginia was led by 42-year-old Brigadier General Irvin McDowell. A West Point grad and veteran of the Mexican War, he was a large, big-boned man. Not particularly handsome, he did possess what some believed a congenial face. Blue-eyed, square-jawed, and bearded, he carried himself with an air of self-confidence. McDowell did not drink smoke, and did not even care for coffee or tea, but he could sure clear a table. He had a gargantuan appetite, which left little time for conversation. Perhaps that was just as well, for there was a stiffness about him, an aloofness that distanced him from others. A bad listener, he forgot names and faces. He could be rude, and on occasion failed to master his temper, but the Secretary of the Treasury, Salomon Chase, championed him. And once Robert E. Lee, yes, R. E. Lee, and another turned down command of the same army, McDowell, the third choice, took the reins of the Department of Northeastern Virginia. Opposing him were these two brigadier generals in gray. 43-year-old P.G.T. Beauregard, and 54-year-old Joseph Eggleston Johnston. Beauregard, the so-called hero of Sumter, 
Though not statuesque, was solidly built, possessed a military bearing, and carried the strut of a confident soldier. With sharp nose, bright eyes, and square jaw, he wore an immaculate mustache and wore his hair medium length with the sides brushed slightly to the front as was the style of the day. The Creole from Louisiana was born in 1818 and grew up accustomed to the life and privilege of money. And because of that, he did have a certain arrogance about him. Both he and his counterpart, McDowell, graduated in the West Point class of 1838, McDowell, 23rd of 45, and Beauregard, 2nd. Incidentally, in January of 1861, Beauregard was appointed superintendent of West Point. But a secessionist, his tenure lasted all of five days. On the last day of March, Beauregard was given command of the Confederate line at Alexandria, Virginia. On June the 1st, he took field command of the 21,800-man Confederate Army of the Potomac headquartered at Manassas Junction. And then there was Joseph E. Johnston, who commanded the 12,000-man Confederate Army of the Shenandoah, which was headquartered near Winchester, Virginia. A small, slight man, he had wispy hair, a goatee, and graduated 13th of 46 in the class of 1829, which included Robert E. Lee, who graduated second. Johnston, nicknamed the Fighting Gamecock, was a proud man and quite sensitive about his reputation. To illustrate, once he was invited to a hunt, he was known to be a crack shot, yet throughout the day, the bird was always too high or too low, the dogs were too close or too far away, and as a result, fearing he might tarnish his reputation, never took a shot the whole day. Johnston's Confederate Army was opposed by 18,000 men under 69-year-old Union Major General Robert Patterson. Born in Ireland in 1792, his family immigrated to Pennsylvania in 1798. He was a veteran of the War of 1812 and served with current Federal General-in-Chief Winfield Scott back in the Mexican conflict. In fact, in 1861, he and Scott were the only two men in the Union who had exercised high command at headquarters and in the field. Now, with McDowell's army advancing from Washington City toward Manassas, Patterson's mission that July was to keep Johnston's Confederate force pinned down. Simply put, he failed, and that would create serious consequences. At 2 p.m. on July the 16th, as Betty Duval and Rose O'Neill Greenhow reported, McDowell's force marched out of Washington City. It was a hot and dusty day that Tuesday, and the march was one that the Union commander did not want to make, but political and popular pressure forced his hand. Ninety-day enlistments were about to run out, and on to Richmond dominated northern headlines. McDowell's force numbered some 37,000, and they were as varied in training as were the colors of their uniforms. Their march was difficult. Untrained soldiers broke ranks at every stream and blackberry patch. There were inexplicable, lengthy halts. One at Akotink Creek serves as an example. The stream ran through a steep ravine. To cross it, a single log. Until corrected, the advance of McDowell's entire army funneled down to one man crossing one log, one at a time. Incredibly, all of McDowell's five divisions still made their marching objective for the day. On the 17th of July, more heat, dust, and straggling. But Confederate-held Fairfax Courthouse fell without a single Union casualty. The next day, Centerville, Virginia was occupied. Eight miles ahead, Beauregard prepared to meet the enemy. He had his entire force behind a little meandering stream known as Bull Run. His Confederate line ran some six miles from the stone bridge on the Warrenton Turnpike to Union Mills Ford on the right. 
Beauregard felt certain that McDowell would attack him at Mitchell's Ford on Bull Run, and so he prepared to meet it. Nine Confederate brigades defended three miles of Bull Run and three likely-to-be-used Fords. An attack did come on July the 18th, but not at Mitchell's Ford. It came at Blackburn's Ford when a federal reconnaissance ran into more than they could handle. McDowell had ordered Union Brigadier General Daniel Tyler and elements of his 1st Division to test Confederate strength. Tyler, who did not much care for McDowell, was aware that the vital railroad junction of Manassas was only three miles away, and with visions of glory he exceeded his orders. Standing in his way, however, was a Confederate brigade under James Longstreet, whose men made excellent use of Bull Run and its brushy cover. Taking casualties and realizing he'd kicked over a Confederate beehive, Tyler tried to call back his men, but a general's worst nightmare. He realized he had lost control of the situation he created. McDowell arrived on the scene around 3.30 in the afternoon and was white hot. Tyler finally retired, but his rash advance cost him 19 killed, 38 wounded, and 26 presumed killed or wounded. Longstreet's brigade won a morale-building engagement, but at the cost of 15 killed, 53 wounded, and 2 missing. The fight that day reinforced Beauregard's belief that McDowell was intent on forcing his men across Bull Run in the Mitchell's Ford area and Federal repulse at Blackburn's Ford brought him another 24 hours to prepare and time for Confederate reinforcements to arrive. Beauregard was pleased about that day, and he had even more reason to be jubilant when he learned that Joe Johnston had been ordered to leave the Harper's Ferry, Winchester area and join him at Manassas. While Patterson's force, just north of the Potomac, sat on its hands, Johnston's army slipped away. Upon reaching Piedmont Station, a stop on the Manassas Gap Railroad, they did something that had never been done before in military history. They were strategically transported from one location to another via rail. The fighting game cock sent word to Beauregard that his troops would arrive late the 19th or early the 20th. Though faster than marching, the going was slow. At four miles per hour, it took eight hours for the cars to cover the 30-plus miles from Piedmont Station to Manassas Junction. So slow was the transfer that by noon of Saturday, July 20th, nearly three-fifths of Johnston's Confederate Army was still awaiting transport back at Piedmont Station. They would arrive, bit by bit, and their presence increased Confederate numbers to roughly 35,000, a number that almost matched McDowell's army. On July 20th, Robert Patterson informed Washington City that two days earlier, his opponent, Joe Johnston had slipped away. Seven days later, he was relieved of command. Meanwhile, Irvin McDowell had his own issues. His camps were more carnival than military, thanks to congressmen, Washington socialites, and sightseers who moved along with the advance. And he still needed a battle plan. And to create one, he called a war council at 8 p.m. on Saturday the 20th. Though he didn't feel well, his stomach acting up, and concerned about issuing taxing orders to inexperienced men and officers, McDowell put together a sound tactical plan. The next day, Sunday the 21st, his 1st Division was to move from Centerville right down the Warrington Turnpike. When they reached the Stone Bridge, they were to demonstrate in front of the enemy. Meanwhile, his 2nd and 3rd Divisions, who were to march down the same turnpike, would cross the Cub Run Suspension Bridge, then turn right and go cross-country toward Sudley Ford. Once across, those two divisions would be in position to strike an exposed and unsuspecting Confederate left. The meeting broke up at 11 p.m. There was no comment. 
McDowell did not ask for any. At 2 a.m. and under a full moon, reveille sounded in the federal camp. Slow to form, it took an hour for the first Union troops to finally move. For McDowell, their advance seemed agonizingly glacial, but his first division, as planned, reached the stone bridge a little after 5 a.m. There, awaiting him, was a 37-year-old South Carolina colonel by the name of Nathan George Shanks Evans, an 1848 West Point grad who finished 36th in his class of 38. He had the 4th South Carolina, 1st Louisiana, two small squadrons of cavalry, and two artillery pieces. He also had an ever-present Prussian orderly who had, strapped to his back, a one-gallon drum. Evans called it his Berelita, and it was filled with whiskey. A soldier said of the South Carolinian, he was at the same time about the best drinker, the most eloquent swearer, and the most magnificent bragger I ever saw. And on this day, militarily, he would be magnificent. A little after 6 a.m., three rounds roared from a lumbering 30-pounder. It was the prearranged signal to let McDowell know his first division was in position at the Stone Bridge. Though his first division was in position, his second was still three miles from Sudley Ford and his third division behind it. Heat, dust, and hunger took their toll on the cross-country march. At 8.45, they still had about a mile to cover. Across the way, a concerned Beauregard heard firing over on his extreme left, and then a signal officer, E. Porter Alexander, sent word that Federals were north of the Warrington Turnpike. Beauregard, to his horror, realized he was being flanked. Attacked on his weakest front, he ordered Bernard B.'s 3rd Confederate Brigade, Francis Bartow's 2nd, and Thomas J. Jackson's 1st to hurry to the exposed Confederate left. By 7.30 a.m., Shanks Evans believed that the Federals in his front at the Stone Bridge were nothing more than a demonstration. That belief became fact when around 8.30 a Confederate signal station spotted reflected sunlight from polished bayonets off in the distance north of the Stone Bridge. To Evans, a message was wigwagged. Look out on your left. You are turned. Evans hastily began to change fronts. He forced marched his men and, I imagine, his Baralita, to the exposed Confederate left, and around 8.45 his men reached a slight elevation known locally as Matthews Hill. There, by 9 a.m., Evans was ready to meet the Union flanking attack. Indeed, 15 minutes later, Union soldiers cleared the woods in front of him and pushed out into the open. Yet, instead of attacking him, it was Shanks Evans who went on the offensive. His small half-brigade stormed two full Union brigades. One unit, the 1st Louisiana Battalion, struck the very middle of the Union formation. It was led by 6-foot, 4-inch, 240-pound mountain of a man, Major Robidoux Wheat. Some of his men, so caught up in the moment threw down their rifled muskets and attacked brandishing only bowie knives. Wheat was with him, but was struck by a bullet that entered his torso just under and forward one armpit, coursed through his chest, and came out the corresponding spot on the other side. With one lung perforated, he was told he was mortally wounded, and he roared, I don't feel like dying yet, and he didn't. Their advance and others were stopped, but every second bought Beauregard time to shift Confederate forces to his threatened left. A little after 10, Brigadier General Bernard B.'s Confederate Brigade arrived and passed through Evans' beleaguered line. B.'s men had already marched some six miles that morning, the last two with the double quick. Right behind B. was Colonel Francis Bartow's 7th and 8th Georgia. They formed to the right of B, and together some 4,500 men stormed a Union force more than twice their number. And the Confederates paid the price. Bartow's Georgians took heavy casualties. 
B's men took fire from three different sides. It was all too much. Both units fell back as the Federal line, one so long that it lapped both Confederate flanks as they pressed forward. Confederate officers knew that if they fell back south of the Warrington Turnpike, the Stone Bridge would be uncovered and that would invite yet another Union threat. And indeed, around 11 a.m., McDowell ordered some 3,400 men to cross another point on Bull Run. They were led by Colonel William T. Sherman. His brigade hoped to wreck the retreating right rear of those Confederates retreating. As Sherman's men moved forward, there was confusion. There was a lot of that this day. One of Sherman's units, the 69th New York, wore gray, and Bernard B.'s men confused them for fellow Confederates. As soon as the 4th Alabama, who had held their fire, unfurled its colors, the 69th cut loose with a blast. Every field officer in the 4th went down, adding to the southern stream for the rear. McDowell was there, and filled with emotion, shouted, Victory! Victory! The day is ours! Indeed, he had reason to be excited. Over half his army was poised to crush a Confederate left that numbered only one-third of McDowell's attacking force. Yet though Evans, B., and Bartow fell back to a landmark known as Henry House Hill, their men bought Beauregard and Johnston three hours, enough time to rush more Confederate troops to the threatened area. McDowell looked to push his advantage. By noon, and with lines stabilized, he was ready to renew his drive, this time to push across Young's Branch at the base of Henry House Hill. As they prepared, remnants of Confederate units who earlier had been driven back reformed with Confederates who had been shifted to blunt the Union advance. Some formed with Wade Hampton's South Carolina Legion on the northern slope of Henry House Hill, and right behind with Thomas J. Jackson, whose Virginia brigade waited in prone position just over the crest of the hill. Anticipating the confusion of uniforms worn that day, for there was no standardization of uniforms as yet, Jackson had his men tie white cotton fabric strips around their hats or arms. Each was given a watchword and signal, strike the left breast with their right hand and shout, Our homes! And then... In the heat of battle, a timeless moment. On the right of Jackson's brigade, a rider dashed madly toward them. It was Bernard B. To Jackson, he shouted, General, they are beating us back. Laconically, Jackson answered, We will give them the bayonet. B. saluted and dashed back to what was left of his beleaguered command. Before the 4th Alabama, he shouted, There is Jackson, standing like a stone wall. Let us determine to die here, and we will conquer. Follow me. To this day, the debate continues. Were those his exact words? Did he say anything at all? If he did say what has been handed down to us, was it a compliment or expressed anger that Jackson's men had not advanced? We'll never know. For soon thereafter, a federal projectile found B. Mortally wounded, he was taken to the rear and died the next day. Around 12.30, Beauregard and Johnston were both by now on Henry House Hill. They rallied men and reformed broken Confederate units. And there, amidst the fighting, it was decided that Beauregard would remain on Henry House Hill, while Johnston would move about a mile to the southern rear to direct arriving reinforcements to the front. The arrangement would later pay dividends. It was now just after 1 p.m., and nine full Confederate regiments were atop Henry House Hill and in good position. With the addition of a few reserves, there were about 7,000 Confederate infantrymen and 13 guns, all prepared to make a desperate stand. To break them, two Federal batteries one under Captain Charles Griffin and the other under Captain James Ricketts, rolled up and unlimbered, almost at the crest of Henry House Hill. They did so, but placed so far out in front of infantry support, they were dangerously exposed. Suddenly, they took sniper fire, and it was believed to have originated from a nearby house on the hill, 
that belonged to Dr. Isaac Henry, thus the name of the landmark. Angered, Griffin and Ricketts turned their guns upon it. Inside, there were no Confederates, but there was Dr. Henry's 85-year-old widow, Judith Carter Henry, her daughter, Ellen, a son, John, and Lucy Griffith, a hired Negro servant. Widow Henry was bedridden, but when the battle literally enveloped her residence, she was moved to the spring house. Despite the danger, she begged to be taken back to the farmhouse, and so her children returned her to her upstairs bed just about the time Griffin and Ricketts batteries rolled up. Son John was outside. Ellen, the daughter, sought safety inside the home's chimney, and Lucy Griffith positioned herself under Widow Henry's bed. As they took refuge, Union artillery fire ripped into the house. One shell splintered the bed, wounded Griffith, and threw Widow Henry to the floor with wounds to her neck and side and almost severed one of her feet. She would die before sundown. Despite the artillery fire directed on the farmhouse, there had been a lull in the general battle itself for almost an hour, both armies bringing up men, solidifying lines, but then the storm broke anew. As it did, once again, confusion reigned. An infantry unit, the 14th New York Zouaves from Brooklyn, the red-legged devils as they were known, moved forward to protect the advanced federal guns. Their course brought them close to Jackson's far-left Confederate regiment, the 33rd Virginia. Their colonel, Arthur C. Cummings, uncertain of the approaching unit's allegiance, told his men to hold their fire while he gave the designated watchword and signal. His delay was costly, for the New Yorkers delivered a devastating volley. It was also about this time there was another casualty to yet another Confederate general. This time, it was Jackson. He had raised his left hand to give an order, and as he did, a Federal projectile struck him between four and middle fingers, breaking his middle digit between the knuckle and first joint. Wrapping it with a piece of cloth, he said nothing and refused to leave the field. Within minutes, another Confederate officer almost lost his life. As Beauregard rode to a Louisiana unit, a shell exploded directly under his horse, disemboweling the animal, but he miraculously was spared. Then yet again, amidst the heat, dust, smoke, and grime of battle, another case of mistaken identity. Though they were told to hold their position, the 33rd Virginia, dressed that day in blue uniforms, advanced on Griffin's Federal Battery, who saw their approach. Griffin ordered two of his canister-loaded guns to turn on them. As they were being pivoted, McDowell's chief of artillery, Major William F. Barry, believing the infantrymen in blue were remnants of the 14th New York, shouted, Captain, don't fire there. Those are your battery supports. Griffin shouted back, They are Confederates as certain as the world. They are Confederates. But Barry rebutted, I know they are your battery supports. Griffin reluctantly turned his guns away. Unmolested, the 33rd Virginia advanced to about 50 yards off Griffin's right flank, then turned to march another 40 yards directly toward the Union guns. Griffin observed this and again turned his guns only to have Barry exclaim, I know it is the battery support. Then the 33rd Virginia settled the debate with a murderous volley. Griffin believed every one of his cannoneers were killed or wounded. More than half of his horses were shot down. He lost every one of his guns save one. The volley also ripped into Ricketts' neighboring battery. He lost every gun and 49 horses. The 33rd now swarmed around their captured prizes, but the drama here was not complete. Repeated volleys from Federal infantry drove the Virginians away, forcing them to leave every captured gun that only moments before had been spoils of war. It was now just after two, and both armies' main strength was on Henry House Hill. The bloody contest would be decided here. For the next two hours, battle lines ebbed and flowed back and forth. Terrain and guns were taken, then lost, then regained. Casualties mounted. 
One was Colonel William Sherman, whose horse was hit. Confederate bullets grazed his knee and struck his coat collar. Another was Colonel Charles Fisher of the 6th North Carolina, who was instantly killed with a ball to his brain. Meanwhile, McDowell, Beauregard, and Johnston continued to funnel more men and units into the vortex of battle on and around Henry House Hill. One group of Confederate reinforcements should be noted. They were under the command of Floridian Brigadier General Edmund Kirby Smith, whose train from Piedmont Station had at last arrived around 1230. Like any good Napoleonic soldier, he heard the sound of guns and moved his men toward them. Their rapid six-mile march took them to Johnston's headquarters, and he personally led the brigade to the front, placing them on the far left of the existing Confederate line, which now stretched past the southern slope of Henry House Hill. However, almost as soon as they were placed, Kirby Smith was wounded and command fell to Brigadier General Arnold Elsey. Joined by Jeb Stewart's 1st Virginia Cavalry, they pushed forward, and emerging from the cover of woods, found themselves on the exposed right flank of a Federal brigade. Elsey pointed to the enemy's colors and shouted, Stars and stripes! Stars and stripes! Give it to them, boys! And with volley and charge, they did. The Federal brigade broke, Around three, there was more drama, and it proved to be the battle's tipping point. Beauregard was informed that a large cloud of dust had been spotted on his left flank. His spirit sank, for he believed the cloud marked the arrival of Patterson's Union Army from out of the northwest. About a mile away, he spotted himself the approaching column, but could not distinguish their identity. He looked for their colors, but with no breeze, he was uncertain. Stars and stripes or stars and bars? Pushed to his emotional limit, finally, there was a slight wind, and it shook out the folds of the approaching column's flag, and it revealed Confederate stars and bars. The unit belonged to Colonel Jubal Early, who had forced marched his men for three hours, and after covering six blistering hot miles, they had reached Chin Ridge, which proved to be the supreme moment and supreme place. From there, Early's men advanced and struck McDowell's exposed right flank. Spent, McDowell had no military response, and his line began to disintegrate. Sensing the dramatic shift in battle, Beauregard then gave the most decisive order he issued all day. He ordered his entire line forward. The battle's decisive moment had arrived. Confusion and fear gripped the Federal Army, and around 4.30 that afternoon, it began to fall back. The men in Union colors had fought well, but there was nothing left to counter Confederate timing and numbers. Back went men with and without orders. Their retreat route east on the Warrenton Turnpike quickly filled with wagons, artillery, retreating cavalry, and infantry. As McDowell's army melted away, Beauregard directed pursuit. Yet despite his fervent desire to destroy the Union army, his force was just as spent in victory as were the Federals in defeat. Still, some Confederate units landed blows, particularly Confederate artillery, which opened on those retreating east down the Warrington Turnpike. There, harried traffic narrowed as Federal units reached the Stone Bridge and just down the road at the bridge over Cub Run. There, columns converged from several directions, the hysteria of the moment heightened by fleeing civilians who had come out from Washington City in their buggies, picnicking in their Sunday's finest to bear witness to the first, and they believed, the last battle of the war. And to that confused, tangled mass of humanity, a Confederate artillery shell landed directly atop the bridge. It panicked horses and caused a wagon to overturn. With escape over Cub Run now blocked, Union retreat unraveled into rout. Reportedly, the last to cross Cub Run Bridge was Irvin McDowell.
He reported 460 killed, 1,124 wounded, and 1,312 missing for a total of 2,896 casualties. A more accurate assessment would put Union losses over 3,000. Though defeated, he did put together a defensive line just south and west of Centerville. It was almost dark when he called his officers together. The majority voted to withdraw back to the capital, some 25 miles away. During the meeting, McDowell was so exhausted, he fell asleep. His battle plan had been good, but his concern about inexperienced men in their first battle was prophetic. Back on the battlefield, there was Confederate elation. President Jefferson Davis was there and for a while actually joined Confederate troops in their pursuit. From the day's fight, 27 cannon had been captured, as well as forges, battery wagons, teams of horses, equipment of all kind, over 500 rifles, and half a million rounds of ammo. Reports put Confederate casualties at 387 killed, 1,582 wounded, and 13 missing for a total of 1,982. A better estimate might be just over 2,000. Despite the human loss, President Davis suggested a congratulatory telegram to the nation and began to write it out. When he finished, he affixed his signature. Interestingly, Beauregard and Johnston were not invited to sign. Silently, Beauregard boiled. The president suggested that pursuit should be renewed at first light the next day, but it never materialized. There was no drive on Washington City, and to answer an age-old what-if, quite honestly, none could possibly have been successfully made. All the next day, reflecting the mood of a defeated northern army and stunned nation, it rained. Back at Manassas, Beauregard and Johnston began to analyze their victory. Of approximately 33,000 available troops, they had fought the battle with 17,000, of which 12% had been casualties. They had won because, quite simply, they had the incredible good fortune to have had reinforcements which arrived throughout the day of the 21st. And once they did, they had been placed at the right place and right time. While Beauregard inspired and demonstrated personal courage reforming regiments and leading them back into line, Joe Johnston, though in the rear, exerted more command influence. He called up regiments and brigades and dispatched them. It was he who extended the Confederate left, which eventually decided the battle. Yet, Beauregard, the more well-known of the two, the so-called hero of Sumter, received most of the glory, so much so that horses, boats, babies, songs, and poems were named for him. His name splashed in headlines. There were those who thought him the Napoleon in gray, presidential timber, but despite the acclaim, he bristled when many in the South read President Davis's telegram, which by his lone signature inferred that it was he who had directed the principal operations on the field. Still, both Beauregard and Johnston were soon promoted to full generals, but soon thereafter, the two quarreled as to who did what at Manassas. And at great disservice to their cause, both quarreled with their president. The two, however, did cooperate on the design of a new battle flag, one hopefully to avoid confusion on future battlefields. On it, a red square with a blue St. Andrew's cross, and within, one five-point star for every Confederate state. In January of 1862, Beauregard was sent west and did not return to the Virginia Theater until Petersburg in 1864. Joe Johnston stayed on at Manassas and in Virginia until he was wounded just outside of Richmond at Seven Pines on the last day of May, 1862. That wound catapulted Robert E. Lee to field command in the east, and Johnston, once recovered, was given commands out west. 
A Confederate presence remained at Manassas until March of 1862, when another Union drive on Richmond materialized down on the York and James River Peninsula. In defeat, Irvin McDowell was now charged with trying to rally a defeated and demoralized army. As for the North, the day after the battle, July 22nd, was tabbed Black Monday. By evening of that day, McDowell was back in Arlington, Virginia. Few in the know blamed him. Militarily, he could be faulted for overestimating the ability of raw troops to move quickly on the morning of the battle. He could be criticized for not making a greater effort to gather better information about roads, streams, and fords. But William Sherman wrote that Bull Run was one of the best planned battles of the war. Back in Washington City, Union General-in-Chief Winfield Scott was incredulous about defeat, but he came to grips with the situation. He forwarded troops south of the capital and professed confidence in McDowell, but saddled with defeat, McDowell's command days were numbered. Indeed, Scott ordered to the capital a young 35-year-old general fresh from minor victories in the mountains of western Virginia. The young lion's name, George Brenton McClellan, Little Mac. Abraham Lincoln took the news of defeat at Bull Run in silence. He blamed himself, politicians, and editors for pushing an unready army into battle, for trying to win the war in one decisive strike. For those who wanted scapegoats, they, of course, targeted Robert Patterson, Irvin McDowell, but also Winfield Scott. Down in Dixie, most were delirious in their joy. In their minds, the question of manhood had been settled. Yet the truly wise understood that Union defeat would prompt rededication, a digging deep within their psyche. Indeed, on the same day that Washington City was crowded with fugitives of a defeated army, the House of Representatives meeting in special session passed this resolution. Resolved that the maintenance of the Constitution, the preservation of the Union, and the enforcement of the laws are sacred trust which must be executed, that no disaster shall discourage us from the most ample performance of this high duty, and that we pledge to the country and the world the employment of every resource, national and individual, for the suppression, overthrow, and punishment of rebels in arms. For the North, Defeat in the conflict's first major battle was a blow to the gut. If you will forgive the curious juxtaposition, the Union's Pearl Harbor. Bitter reversal, yet grim resolve to eventually prevail. Tough lessons gathered from events on a hot and humid Sunday in July of 1861. Lessons learned from defeat along the winding banks of Bull Run on the plains of Manassas. For the North, after the defeat at Bull Run, there was rededication and recommitment. Even in the victorious South, soon thereafter, there came the unsettling realization that the conflict would not be a short six-month affair. There would be many more battles, far more human sacrifice. Indeed, only 13 months after the first Battle of Manassas, the war would require a second confrontation on the same bloodied soil. Such is the nature of war. And for 31 million Americans, the July 1861 fight along Bull Run reinforced the fact that wars, particularly civil wars, rarely end when people hoped they would. I hope you'll join us for the next installment when we follow the life and controversial military career of the man who replaced Irvin McDowell, the man who took command of the Federal Army that defended Washington City, George Brenton McClellan. Until then, I'm Fred Kiger. Thank you for listening.